Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I am continuing a series talking about how to follow God's will. And actually, this five-part teaching album that I have on how to follow God's will is a follow-up to how to find God's will. So for the last, uh, I think that this is about the beginning of my fifth week of teaching that I've been talking about God's will. The very first thing we did was emphasize that God has a will, a destiny, a purpose for you that was established before you were ever born, when you were still in your mother's womb. God already had predetermined a plan for you, but it doesn't come to pass automatically. And so we talked about a lot of things, really highlighted Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Those are the verses that God used to change my life and to show me His will for my life. So we taught about how important it is to find God's will. And then as we started talking about how to follow God's will, the very first thing that I dealt with was Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, about delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Now that's a big if, but if you delight yourself in the Lord, and that's talking about just make God your uh, focus, that He is first in your life, that you are following Him with your whole heart. If you are doing that, then God puts His desires in your heart. And so many people are afraid to follow the desires of your heart. And you know, if you aren't seeking God, I guess that's a well-placed fear. You shouldn't just do whatever you want. But if you have really put God first, God will lead you through the desires of your heart. And conversely, the opposite of this is, that if you have really put God first, it could be that the dissatisfaction you have about your life is God giving you that dissatisfaction and trying to move you in a different direction. I've experienced this multiple times, that when it's time for me to change, that God just changes my heart. Things that I, you know, was content doing all of a sudden, I wasn't content with. I remember when I lived in Sigaville, Texas. I just love living in Sigaville, Texas. I love ministering to those people. And one day, long story, but God uh, just took that away. And I looked out the window and thought, who in the world would want to live in Sigaville, Texas? I just lost my love for the people. I lost my love for living there. I spent about a couple of hours praying about it and wondering, God, what's going on? Because it was just such a, I mean, it was just like somebody flipped a switch on the inside of me and my whole desire to be there just left. And within a matter of minutes, I just desired to be gone. And so I spent a couple of hours praying about it. And during that time, the Lord spoke to me and told me that we were to leave Sigaville, Texas, and that we would be going somewhere else that He had showed me. I prayed about the timing on it, and the Lord showed me that it was going to be November the 1st. And so I prayed about it for a couple of hours. I went home to tell my wife that we were going to be moving on November the 1st. This was like August or something. And I went home to tell my wife. And when I got home, there was a for sale sign in our front yard. And I went in and I said, Jamie, what's the for sale sign? She says, the landlord came by and put the for sale sign up and said, we had to be out November the 1st. <laughs> Amen. It's perfect confirmation. And yet that's how God uh, did this is he just changed my desires. So these are the things that we've already talked about. What I want to deal with today is to share with you one of my favorite things to teach on. I have gotten a tremendous amount of benefit from looking at the life of Moses and relating that in how to find and how to follow and how to fulfill God's will. And God has spoken just volumes of things to me through the life of Moses. You know, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe it's verse 6 and 11, I'm not sure the exact references, but it's talking about all of the Old Testament saints, the things that are recorded in the Old Testament, and it says all of these things happened unto them for our examples upon whom the end of the world has come, so that we through them could learn not to lust and not to gripe and not to murmur and complain, etc. And the scripture makes it very clear that the things in the Old Testament were written for us to learn through. And it's amazing to me 
that most people don't learn through the scriptures and through the things that are recorded about people. Instead, they just go out and make all of the same mistakes all over again. It's like some people cannot learn except through hard knocks. And you know what? If you learn through hard knocks and if you live through it, it does make a great testimony. But you know what? Not everybody lives through it. And some people limp through life the rest of their life because of some of the mistakes that they've made. There's a better way. And that better way is to go to God's Word and learn through what happened to other people. And Moses is a classic example of a person who knew God's will but didn't know how to follow God's will. He knew what God wanted him to do, but he just supposed that God was going to use him because of his position and because of all of the clout, all of the honor that had been given unto him. He found out what God's will was, and then instead of waiting on God's timing and waiting on God's plan to accomplish that will, he decided that he would take a word from God and make a paragraph out of it. And he just filled in the blanks. And he says, God, thank you for showing me what you want me to do. I can handle it from here. And Moses went out and totally messed up God's will. And I'm going to say some things right here just in introduction, and I'll come back and I'll establish these things through Scripture as we go through it. But Moses cost himself 40 years in the wilderness that was not God's will. And let me just say some things here. <clears throat> some of you are more influenced by the movie the Ten Commandments than you are by what the Word of God has to say. <clears throat> and you know what? I'm not against that show. I own that show. I watch that show. I think it's great, but not everything in that movie, the Ten Commandments, is scriptural. For instance, it shows that Moses didn't know what God's will for his life was. He didn't even realize that he was a Jew, that he was just a nice old boy that went out and killed an Egyptian who was oppressing an Israelite, and he just stumbled into these things. That's not what the Word reveals. I'm going to show you from Scripture that Moses knew God's call on his life. And Moses, when he uh, went into the wilderness, this was not God's will. Again, the show, the Ten Commandments, as Moses is turned out into the desert, the narrator comes on, and he comes on in this deep, God-sounding voice about how that Moses goes out into the wilderness, into the desert, where scorpions and snakes are and where prophets are made. And then he starts talking about all this stuff. And basically, they present it as this was God's will and this is how God was going to perfect him. That is not what the Scriptures teach. Moses could have stayed in the house of Pharaoh and have learned and have done what God needed to do. It was Moses' disobedience that put him in the wilderness for 40 years. And... The children of Israel spent 30 years extra bondage in the land of Egypt that was outside of God's will because of Moses' disobedience. Now, I know some of you are thinking, man, where did you get this? I'm going to show you from Scripture. But I'm just saying all of these things up front. I'll go back to Scripture and I'll confirm it. But see, these are some of the things that you learn from Moses. Moses was self-willed. He found out God's will for his life but he tried to bring it to pass in his own strength and power. He cost himself a lot of suffering that wasn't God's will. And he cost the Jews a lot of suffering that wasn't God's will. And I'm telling you, just finding out God's will for your life is absolutely essential. It's important. You aren't going to accidentally fulfill God's will, but... Knowing God's will for your life is essential, but it's only a part of the puzzle, a piece of the puzzle. You've also got to find out how to follow God's will. There is a God way to accomplish His will, and then there is a way that seems right unto us, but it is never going to accomplish God's will. And I'm sure that I am speaking to people right now who you know what God called you to do. You had an inspiration that was from God, but you went out and in your own strength have tried to do it, and you have totally messed up. And there are some of you relating exactly to what I'm saying. One of the benefits of this teaching for you is going to be that Romans 11:29 says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And you can see that in the life of Moses, that even though he messed up big time 
actually killed a man, thinking that killing a man was going to bring God's will to pass. He messed up, spent 40 years in the wilderness, was separated from where he was supposed to be and just, I mean, major, major problems. And yet when he was 80 years old, God came and gave him another chance and he did fulfill God's will. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. I don't care how badly you've messed up. I don't care how far off track you are. I don't care if it, you know, in your own thinking, you think that it's impossible. God could never use me. He's put me on a shelf. He's forsaken me. I'm telling you in the name of the Lord that God's gifts and callings for you are without repentance. Regardless of how far off track you are, God can put you back on track. God can fulfill His will in your life. And Moses is a great testimony to this. There is a lot that you can learn from Moses about what not to do. But you know what? One thing about Moses is, it says in Hebrews chapter 11, that he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Today, we use that word endure, and we sometimes use it to just say that a person is putting up with something, and they are, they are enduring it. it. You know, they may just be laying on the couch watching television, and we say they're enduring their situation. But the Bible word endure means to persevere. It's an active word. It's actually talking about faith over a very prolonged period of time. And so Hebrews chapter 11, when it says that Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible, Moses, again, you got to renew your mind from this movie, The Ten Commandments. Moses wasn't out in the wilderness <clears throat> asking God to leave him alone and trying to forget God and totally get away from God. No, he was there persevering and believing that God was still going to use him. Moses endured. Moses persevered. And even after 40 years, after he had totally messed up, he was 80 years old, God came and intervened and touched his life. And of course, here we are thousands of years later talking about Moses. And God used him in a supernatural way. So there's good news for you, even if you've messed up. You know what? God can still use you. So let me turn over to the book of Exodus and read some of these passages of Scripture about Moses. And again, I may not have time today to get into everything that I want to share about this, but let, just keep this in mind as you read this, that if you read Exodus chapter 2, you could come to some of the conclusions that that movie, the... Um, uh, Ten Commandments came to because there's not a lot of explanation given right here. It's just some detail and there's a lot of blanks here and those people just filled in the blanks. But we're going to turn over to Acts chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 11 where people wrote about Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they give information that isn't listed right here in Exodus chapter 2. So if you take the word and let it comment on itself, we're going to come to some of these conclusions. They're going to be totally different than the way that most of us have perceived the life of Moses. And this is going to uh, have direct application to you. So in Exodus chapter 2 is where Moses was born. And in verse 1, it says, And there was a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. If you would have read previously in the first chapter, Pharaoh saw that the Israelites who were living as uh, uh, guests in the land of Egypt had begun to grow and multiply to such a degree. They were so numerous that he was afraid that if any enemy came into the land that all of these Israelites would join up with the enemy and overthrow the Egyptians. And he saw them as a threat. So he began to put them under slavery and he made them build all of these uh, treasure cities and he gave a command that all of the male, male children should be killed. And of course what this was going to do is eventually decimate the population of Israel and bring them into subjection and, and uh, make his kingdom secure. So that's the background and this is the reason that Moses' parents hid him for three months but when they couldn't hide him any longer they put him in this little ark 
that they made and put it into the river Nile and just let it float and see where it went. And so in verse 4 it says, And his sister stood afar off to wit or to see or to know what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister, this is talking about Moses' sister, Miriam. She said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take the child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. You know, before we get into the story, this is just amazing that here is a person who God was going to use to deliver the Jews. It is absolutely miraculous. And according to the things I've already taught, God's plans for us are established before we're ever born. Before we are even conceived in the womb, God has a plan. So God didn't just, you know, 40 years later see Moses and think, oh, well, he's a Jew and I could use him. No, this was planned from the beginning. And it is so neat to see how that Pharaoh had given the command that the Israelites would kill all of the male children. Not only did Moses' parents not kill him, but this ark just happened to float right under Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter took Moses' mother and paid, Pharaoh, uh, paid Moses' mother to nurse him. <laughs> Amen. So instead of Moses being killed as Pharaoh wanted, the parents of uh, Moses actually got paid to raise Moses, and then Moses came and lived with Pharaoh, and he was raised in the uh, uh, Egyptian courts. He had all of the wisdom and the knowledge of the Egyptians. So here's Pharaoh actually paying for the one who would in eventually lead the Israelites out of bondage. I tell you, God is awesome. Not only did he preserve the person that he was going to use, but he made the man who was trying to kill God's messenger pay for the whole thing. I just think that's awesome. You know, here's another point that I want to make before we go on, and that is that not only right here with Moses, uh, uh, Pharaoh tried to kill all of the male children. There was an attack on children. When Jesus was born, of course, the greatest figure that ever came into the history of the human race, the pivotal figure, uh, Herod tried to kill all of the children from two years age and younger, and there was an attack on the children. And here we are again with abortion and the fact that over 59 million children have been killed since the Roe versus Wade decision, and that's not even including all of the children that are aborted in New York and California, which aren't required to list all abortions. Nearly 60 million children murdered and you know what, again, I believe that we are in a critical time in history. I believe that we are in the last days. And uh, I think that there's a parallel. Every time that God does something significant, somehow or another, Satan sees this coming and he tries to attack by killing all of these children. And yet God's plan got done. It got done in Moses' day. It got done in Jesus' day. <clears throat> and guess what? It's going to get done in our day. God is going to win. And so it says in verse 10 that the child grew and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she called his name Moses and she said, because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now, again, if you only take these scriptures by themselves, and, and we're going to turn over and read Acts chapter 7, and this will give more detail to it. But if you just read this, you might suppose or wonder, did Moses really know that he was a Jew? But if you understand, over in, Hebrew, uh, in Acts chapter 7, I'll turn over and read that on our program tomorrow. But in Acts chapter 7, it says that he went out supposing his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver 
the Jews, and yet they didn't understand. So when you read that and you have that understanding, then look at the wording here. In verse 11, it says that when he was grown, he went out unto his brethren. Now, it's not said here, but in Acts chapter 7, it makes it very clear. He knew they were his brethren, and it says that he looked on them and saw this Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren, and he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. And so in Acts chapter 7, again, I'll, I'll get to this tomorrow, it shows that when he did this, he supposed his brethren would understand how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Also, it looks like that when he saw that this was known, it says Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. In verse 15, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Again, this looks like that Moses left Egypt out of total fear, and it even mentions in verse 14 that he feared. But if you turn over into Hebrews chapter 11, and we will be using these scriptures on our program tomorrow, it shows that he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, it's said that he feared, but Hebrews chapter 11 says he didn't fear the wrath of the king. I believe, and I'll show you this, Moses realized he had blown this whole thing. He realized that he had messed up, and he feared. He feared God. He feared that he had failed. He feared, and there is fear, but uh, Hebrews chapter 11 says it wasn't that he fled from the king and feared him. It's possible that he might have known that if he stayed around Mo that the king was going to kill him, but he didn't flee out of fear. It was a strategic retreat. In other words, he, it was prudent, and it was wisdom, but it wasn't just fear. And then during the time that he was in the wilderness, he endured and believed God. So anyway, we'll get into more of this tomorrow, but I want to show you that God, Moses knew God's will for his life. And yet, he went out and tried to accomplish it with his own strength, with his own power, and he messed up. Cost himself 40 years in the wilderness, cost the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage. And we're going to be discussing this in more detail. But I tell you, there is a direct application to this. If you know God's will for your life, that's wonderful. It's absolutely essential. But that's not all that there is to it. You also have to know God's timing and God's plan for bringing that will to pass. So you not only need to find God's will, but you need to learn how to follow God's will. And that's what this second teaching in this three-album set that I'm teaching on is all about. It's how to follow God's will. We are now offering uh, the teaching, the second teaching in this five-part set entitled Moses Missed God's Timing. And I tell you, this would really help you. So listen to our announcer and please call or write today, get these materials, and then join me again as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Follow God's Will, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. This series is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 16 pounds when you write or call. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the God's Will package, which includes three albums, How to Find God's Will, How to Follow God's Will, and How to Fulfill God's Will. As a bonus, the package includes the Destiny Stories DVD, highlighting four stories of people whose lives were transformed as they pursued God's will for their lives. The entire package has a catalog value of 48 pounds. But Andrew considers this teaching so important, he'd like to get it to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering it to you for a gift of just 40 pounds or more. Remember to specify the CD or DVD package when you order. The second audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. 
But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD titled, Moses Missed God's Timing, Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled, God Wants You Well for eight pounds 50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Colorado Springs for the Andrew Womack Ministers Conference October 4th through the 8th and in Buxton, Derbyshire in England for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference October 18th through the 20th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. There was a time in my life, and we'll start with, I went to church and that. But after I had my second son, I was getting into teaching in Ireland of sanctification and things like that. And I had a very bad time with that. And I was afraid of God. I was afraid of God. I was afraid to touch the Bible or go to church. I used to always shrink when I went into church for a wedding or a christening. I was so afraid of God. I thought he was really out to get me. But my son had got me, he was in the army at the time, he brought me a beautiful Bible. But I never opened it. I, I never opened it. It was just an ornament, like, you know. I felt safe with it. Don't know why, but I felt safe with the Bible. And then whenever I heard Andrew talking, like, that sort of opened all the Word of God to me. The first time I heard Andrew, my husband had just died, which is 24 years next month. And somebody had got hold of some of Andrew's chair, so, so tapes, before he came to England. And it was how to know God's will for your life. And if we were to tell people that the point of salvation isn't just getting your sins forgiven, but it's having intimacy that God Almighty loves you, he is so passionate about you that God Almighty wants to spend time with you. He wants to be your best friend. And I started listening. And you couldn't believe what you're hearing, could you? You know, it was amazing. Amazing to know you were healed. To know you had a God that loved you, not that, you know, um, not done that was judging you. Some people still think that, that they're under the wrath of God. And he put that all in Jesus, didn't he? He's love, isn't he? And, he? and he just loves us so much. 